Hello. Oh, it works. Um, so I'm going to talk about this, something I've tended to keep a little bit quiet um, about before, which is that period of the 60s and 70s, which um, has suddenly started to come alive in my memory and also has um, forms a theme in my new book, Various Pets Alive and Dead. Even though the book's in no way autobiographical, heaven forbid, it does um, draw on some of those memories and experiences. So in 1970, I was living in London with my boyfriend and doing a PhD on um, probably the world's great squatter, Gerard Wynne Stanley, um, the founder of the Diggers. And there he is digging on the commons at St. George's Hill and um, seeking for the true meaning of freedom. Uh, the 1640s was a time of great social upheaval and there was a civil war and the enclosures had already started and there were lots of people had been driven off the land so there were hungry landless people wandering around. When Stanley himself had been bankrupted um, by the civil war and uh, so he acquired quite a following by preaching that the land should belong to everybody. And they marched up onto St. George's Hill um, in, near Cobham in Surrey and built themselves makeshift huts and started to plough up the land and plant vegetables to feed themselves. Can we have the next picture? Now, if you go to St. George's Hill now, you won't find scruffy diggers and their dilapidated huts. What you will find is the Weybridge, um, St. George's Ladies Golf Club, all together much more neat and wholesome. But if we could just have picture three, you'll see that um, the scruffiness and dil dilapidation have survived, albeit we've now moved from St. George's Hill to London. And I think this is in fact West London, though I'm not sure exactly where. Um, because uh, squatting um, a, as a tradition was being revived on a very large scale in, in London in the 1970s. So by the mid-70s, there were some 30,000 squatters in London, um, and I was one of them. Whole streets and hundreds of individual houses were boarded up um, by the council waiting for redevelopment. I think in this area around Ladbroke Grove, you had um, Westway, didn't you? And um, the, uh, other people I used um, so were squatting around uh, Villa Road and um, Tolmouth Square and places like that. And so there were these hundreds of empty houses boarded up, um, for really for inordinate periods of time you felt and there were hundreds of people like me fresh from university fired up with ideas from what was happening in Paris at the time and also um, you know we've been fired up by the anti-Vietnam war movement and we weren't ready to go and settle down and live back with our families and um, certainly we weren't willing to live in um, bed sits which seemed to be the main form of accommodation that had been set aside for people like us or to knuckle down to the um, nine to five lifestyle. People could who could afford it bought houses and lived with their friends and formed communes. People who couldn't afford it did the same thing, but they did it in squats. So at that time, um, I gave up my PhD and went to live in a squat. And I can remember the most exciting um, moment of breaking into my first ever squat. And it was sort of 11 o'clock at one night in June, and I had my long, long hair and my flared dungarees. And we sort of, there were three of us, three women, creeping up the road with um, a torch in one hand and a brick in the other and a sleeping bag and a backpack on our backs. And it was a very scary moment because it, um, although squatting, in the sense of being in a house, was not illegal, um, breaking and entering was. So if you got caught before you'd managed to change the locks, you were still outside of the law and you'd, you'd get arrested and prosecuted. And in fact, that did happen to me once. Um, but um, that time, this first time, we were lucky. We'd staked out our house. We knew it belonged to the council and we knew it had been empty for two years. What we didn't know is what it was going to be like when we got in. Um, so we broke a pane, unscrewed the latch, heaved up the... Um, the, the, the window frame, and we scrambled in, in, of course, into the darkness with our torches, and we didn't want to be seen walking around with our torches because that would um, arouse suspicion. So we, as quickly as we could, we just crept into the back of the house and sort of unrolled our sleeping bags and tried to get a bit of sleep, though it was all very scary. And then, round about five o'clock, just as dawn was breaking, there was this sort of huge, the whole house started to shake, and there was shuddering sound like an explosion. 
and we thought, oh my God, you know, we're being raided. But in fact, um, it was the first commuter train of the day on the Liverpool Street, Fenchurch Street line, which actually ran along the back of our garden, certainly less far than the, the, the back of it, probably about as far as the end of the stage there. And um, so we got up and started to explore our new home. And it didn't take us very long to discover why the council had decided it was unfit for human habitation. Um, it had no bathroom. And in fact, as far as we could tell, it had no, no lavatory at all. Um, we, you know, which was quite bad news because a lot of things you can live without, but um, that's a bit essential. And eventually we did locate a lavatory in the back garden. Um, but, of course, to get into the back garden, because we didn't have a key, you had to um, open up the, the back window and climb out through the window and go round into the backyard. And there was, th there was the lavatory. It had no door. And, as I say, about, um, you know, 10 metres away, the uh, main train line, the trains were flashing past by now. But, fortunately, they were going quite fast, and only very occasionally did they stop. Um, the other... The um, thing that we discovered, of course, was that in the kitchen, um, there was no cooker, but that's all right, because um, I think s s somebody had a baby belling left over from a previous life. And there was only one single cold tap. There was no hot water in the house at all. And um, there was one of those stone butler sinks, which I know, know now are regarded as terribly chic, but whenever I see them, I just view them with absolute horror. Because actually, there was nothing, you know, now you have, you have a sink with something at the side where you can put things, but in fact, everything. We washed ourselves, the children, uh, the clothes which couldn't wait for the laundrette, and the dishes, and the food. It all happened in that same sink. It was, it was dreadful. Um, and I have to say that... Um, it, it didn't last so long. Can we, can we have the next picture? Okay, so this was, th this was our next squat. And as you can see, um, instead of having a railway line at the bottom of the garden, um, we had a tower block. I don't know if you can quite see it up there. This was also in Bow. I don't know whose motorbike is, but isn't it groovy? Can you see? Oh, you can't quite see the leopard skin seat, but it just finishes the look of the house, doesn't it? Um, and this house, actually, it was amazing. It had a bathroom. It's the, it was the only bathroom in the row, and the gas heater had a big um, condemned sticker on the boiler, but we didn't care. We got in there and wallowed in hot water. It was very nice. Um, I've been back to that area since. I looked at my old houses, and I was astonished to see that these places now sell for half a million. And in fact, although it, this was a squat then, there are still squats in the same road, and the street has never been demolished. And I think the council have changed their houses, their minds about it now, and they, th they think, actually, these little houses are quite nice, and a bit nicer than what replaced them. So um, when we think about the 1960s, when I started to write about the 1960s, the things that I remembered were the lifestyle things, you know, the really the funny clothes that we wore um, and the music um, we listened to and, okay, the drugs and the sex. We all draw a veil over those. Can we have the next picture now? And here we are in the kitchen, and th th this is the interior shot of the same house. You can just about see the second on the left. And you can see, actually, more or less what we're having for dinner, which is a big saucepan full of rice, brown rice, overcooked, and a big bowl, which was either lentils or beans, because that's what we ate. And um, so, so we, we, um, we lived, we, sh we shared quite a lot of possessions. Um, we shared, obviously, we shared meals. Uh, we shared some money. We shared childcare, um, which was quite important. And we, sometimes we shared sexual partners. And just, just to reassure you, the children who lived with us in the squat actually have turned out really lovely. They're... Um, they're resourceful, they're successful, they're well-adjusted, um, you know, they're, they're in good jobs, they earn good money, um, and they're still a bit rebellious. Um, but what's so much harder to remember, when I came to write the book, what I found was much harder to remember what was going on in our heads, what on earth did we think we were doing? And I think that we thought that in some way we were sort of engaging with the masses. Um, and what I remember, the things that we did... Um, in a way, they seem rather quite crazy, but in fact, in a way, they're things which are quite a good idea. One of the things that we did was that we organized a food co-op. Um, so um, the, the, the women in our commune, and also some of the women from the council estate and uh, from the nearby houses, um, we, we got together, we pulled money, and we used to go to the cash and carry and bring back food, which would then divide out between people. Now, 
Um, I have to say that the women from the um, housing estate, they weren't interested in brown rice and lentils. What we came back with was butter, cheese, bacon, sugar. That's what they wanted. And, we, and, and doing it cooperatively, we did actually manage to save a bit of money over what they could um, get those sort of um, things for in the supermarket. And, and the sausages, there, was, there were always a lot of rather nasty sausages. Um, and the other thing that we did was that we, we ran a play group. And um, this was in another squatted house. It was at the end of the road. And it was actually in much better condition than the houses that we lived in. It, I don't know why it had been um, closed up by the council. But um, it certainly it had a lavatory because the children would have needed that. And it had a basin. And so the front room was, was turned into um, a play group. And the, the, the poor children, who we, who we were all practicing on, really, in the commune, sort of practicing bringing them up as right on human beings. And they're little kids from the neighborhood who weren't sure about this right on business, business but they like to have these weird people to play with. Um, and so I guess if there was an idea behind it, it was, it was about cooperation and about the idea that actually, by working together, uh, we, can, we can achieve more than we can achieve in our own. And that's something that I still believe. And then things changed, and we all moved on, and we settled down. And I moved up to Leeds, and then on to Sheffield, and I started to write my uh, still unpublished novels. OK, um, can we have the next picture? Uh, and then it was nice to find that a new generation has taken off where we left off. Um, the quotation is there, there is from Wynne Stanley, because what Wynne Stanley and um, the present Occupy movement have in common is the idea that actually what's in your head, it's quite nice, but it's actually what you do that's very important. I think another similarity um, between, um, certainly between the um, first lot of diggers and the present Occupy movement is that although their numbers were small, um, they seemed to sort of um, catch the popular imagination and so they had a sort of much higher profile, maybe, than their numbers would have warranted. Um, there, may, there would have been maybe about 10 digger settlements in England in the 1640s. And they were very soon broken up and moved on. The, the diggers didn't last a year. They ne never managed to actually harvest um, those first um, vegetables that they planted. And as you know, the Occupy London people lasted maybe for only six months. Um, but some of the themes also are quite similar. If you think about the idea of that the early diggers were talking about the enclosures of the commons. And um, the, the present occupied people are also concerned about things which are, used to be public, used to belong to everybody, and now are being enclosed. I don't just mean things that you know, we've all seen, water, railways, schools, but even things like the gene for basmati rice and the human genome, which used to be in the public domain, are, are now have sort of belonged to corporations. It's most odd. Um, and and a, another thing that they had in common, which they also had, it, had with us, really, is that uh, they had really terrible toilet facilities. The original diggers, well, they had the bushes, and that was probably the most hygienic um, of all of them. And in, in, a, in a funny sort of way, what happened to the Occupy people was the... Um, that they attracted the, all the homeless people in the area, all the hangers-on, the drunks, the druggies. And although, in fact, uh, you know, the occupied people themselves and were, were a bit like us, you know, nice um, university-educated middle-class kids, somehow um, they really managed to create such squalor around them that it really put off a lot of people who would have been um, possibly sympathetic. Um, and so, in a way, the... They, they were brought down, not so much by, by themselves, but by the people who attached themselves to themselves. Okay, so um, enough of that. And if we could just have the last picture. Thank you. Um, the, the, my new book is about, um, it's, it's about the um, commune and the life of the 60s and 70s. It's, it's not really based on my commune, but it's particularly about the generation gap because I ended up wondering so much about the children who grew up with us, who've actually, as I say, turned out so fine. Um, and the older generation, who are a bit sort of elderly, like myself, what I find is that many of our children, ma many of our generation, um, our children have become bankers and entrepreneurs. And even somebody I know has a son who's a hedge fund manager. And, you know, we're all a little bit sort of perplexed by this. We, do, we, do, we don't, don't understand quite what it is, what they do. 
and we're not sure we approve, but we still love them because our children. And I think that they still love us, even though they think that, that, that we're um, slightly bonkers. So in my novel, we've got the, 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 the younger generation, about the, they're the same generation as the children who lived in the commune. One of them's grown up to be a teacher with a cleanliness fetish, and the other one works in a bank. At the time of the... Um, Lehman Brothers collapse, and he gets embroiled in all the dodgy practices which have um, brought us to where we are. And they, they laugh at their parents, and they laugh at the clothes we used to wear, and the follies that we used to commit, um, just like we used to laugh about our parents. And they wonder, um, just like we did, do over, people over 50 actually have sex? And I think I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you.